is the Lord. Thank you for joining us once again for another episode of the Bible study. And tonight will be the, 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 the hammer had fallen. But 20 to 23, it is the motivation what inspired God to uh, declare this judgment. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our Lord, we bless you and we honor you. And we thank you and we glorify you. And tonight we are gathered here in your name and we pray as we go through the pages of scripture, our eyes will be opened, will be enlightened. Revelation will be a part of us and a part of since there is nothing new under the earth, we will be able to learn from the scriptures and it is going to add value into our own lives. And it is in Jesus name we have prayed and believed. Amen. So this is a very long read. But um, we will look at it in four different sections because the read is almost, is also divided into the four sections. So let's read and then we'll go to every part of it. It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that a certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Have you come to inquire of me as I live, says the Lord God? I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abomination of their fathers. Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel and raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand in an oath to them saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. Then I said to them, each of you throw away the abominations which are before his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, but they, rebel, they rebelled against me and will not obey me. They did not all cast away the abomination which were before their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for them my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles among whom they were in, whose sight I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, I made them go out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctified them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I I will not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of the land, because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profaned my Sabbath, for their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless, my eyes spared them from destruction. I did not make an end of them in the wilderness. But I say to their children in the wilderness, do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgment, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God, walk in my statutes, keep my judgment and do them. Hallow my Sabbath and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to observe my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. But they profane my Sabbath. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew my hand and acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the Gentiles, in whose sight I had brought them out. Also, I raised my hand in an oath to those in the wilderness, that I will scatter them among the Gentiles and disperse them throughout the countries, because they had not executed my judgment, but had despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbath, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. Therefore, 
I also gave them up to statues that were not good and judgments which they could not leave. And I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts in that they caused all the firstborn to pass through the fire that I might make them desolate and that they might know that I am the Lord. Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, In these two your father have blasphemed me by being unfaithful to me when I brought them into the land concerning which I had raised my hand in an oath to give them. And they saw all the hills and all the thicket trees. There they offered their sacrifices and provoked me with their offering. There they also sent up their sweet aroma and poured out their drink offering. Then I said to them, what is this high place to which you go? So its name is called Bama to this day. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, that says the Lord God, are you defiling yourselves in the man of your fathers and committing allotry according to their abominations? For when you offer your gifts and make your sons pass through the fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols, even to this day. So shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel, as I live, says the Lord God. I will not be inquired of, of by you. What you have in your mind shall never be. When you say we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries serving wood and stones. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. I will bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with fury poured out, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there I will plead my case with you face to face, just as I pleaded with the case with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will plead my case with you, says the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you, and those who transgress against me, I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, serve every one of you his idols, and thereafter, if you will not obey me, but profane my holy name, no more with your gifts and your idols. For on my holy mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I will accept them, and there I will require your offering and the first fruit of your sacrifice together with all your holy things. I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will be hallowed in you before the Gentiles. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I raised my hand in an oath to give your fathers. And there you shall remember your ways and all your doings with which you are defiled, and you shall load yourselves in your own sight because of all the evils that you have committed. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doing, O house of Israel, says the Lord God. Furthermore, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards the south. Preach against the south and prophesy against the forest land, the south, and say to the forest of the south, Hear the word of the Lord, that says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it, and I shall not be quenched. Then I said, Our Lord God, they say of me, does he not speak parables? Now, that's a long read, of course, but of course, in that long read, there are many things that we are able to cover. Number one, the first thing that we are able to get, first of all, generally, is God trying to show Israel their historical moral plane, their historical uniform moral plane. From the past up to now, there has been a consistent, sorry, moral plane among the Israelites of abandoning God and servicing altars of Baal and idols and that has been frequently upon them. The other general thing that we see in the reading is God faithfulness and God faithful grace. That God kept on pardoning them and restoring them. So the first thing we see there is a uniform moral plane. The second thing we also pick out of this 
is God's faithfulness is also uniform all along. He keeps on restoring them, loving them, caring for them. And, and you know, the other thing we begin to see, there is a persistent rebelliousness among Israel. So the moral plane, God's faithfulness, there is also a continuous uh, rebelliousness among Israel. But also we find a very consistent statement that God keeps on re restoring them because of the reputation of his name. When the Bible says, for, the, for my name's sake. So this is the general theme of the many verses we have read. One is uniform moral plane of Israel. Two, it's God's faithful, faithful grace. God faithful grace. Number three, we see persistent rebelliousness of Israel. And number four, we see God guarding his reputation. God guarding his reputation. When he makes an oath, when he swears by himself, he must fulfill. Now, when you begin to dig deep uh, in this particular reading, when you begin to dig deep, um, which you are going to get it, first of all, the introduction from verse 1 to 4. When you look at verse 1 to 4, we realize that some certain elders had gone to seek the face of the Lord. It came to pass in the seventh day, in the fifth month of the tenth day, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. So that name to inquire of the Lord means securing a divine revelation concerning a particular matter or event. Inquiring the Lord means um, it means securing a divine revelation concerning a certain matter or event, securing a divine revelation. So when the elders went, they wanted to understand what was happening. And looking at the context of the writing, we begin to see um, they wanted information concerning Zedekiah's attempt to partner with Egypt. That is what they wanted to understand. Son of man speak to the elders of Israel and said to them, Thus is the Lord God. Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abomination of their fathers. So this time, the elders wanted to know what God was planning. Now, we said yesterday that when you understand history and when you are acquainted with culture, and the chronological events, it becomes very easy for you to get revelation. Now, according to this scripture, uh, Zedekiah was the last king uh, that ruled Judah. And at this particular time, there were news that the king of Egypt had conquered Sudan. And this news reached Judah, and this news reached Jerusalem. And so Zedekiah began to conspire to enter into uh, an agreement with Egypt so that Egypt can protect Israel and so that Egypt can, can fight on behalf of Israel. It was a treaty they were supposed to enter. Now, this is in history. So after this victory came, um, Zedekiah tried to see if they can enter into a coalition. Remember, and then there was a rumor that Egypt was headed now to Palestine. And that is where now the Babylonian rulership was. So they have conquered Sudan. Now they want to go to Palestine and conquer. And so this conversation gave hope to the exiles that were in Babylon. And so they wanted to inquire of the Lord whether the agreement or the treaty between Zedekiah and Egypt will be a treaty that was going to deliver them from Babylon. Remember we said this is Ezekiel giving a prophecy to a portion of exiles. The whole of Israel had not been exiled. There were three journeys towards the exile. So all the people were not there, but the first lot had already been exiled. And so Ezekiel, that was the audience uh, that Ezekiel had. The, the rulership was still going. Jehoiakim had just been captured. He was now in Babylon. And now Zedekiah had taken power. So at this time, there was hope. Rumors in the street said that, you know, Egypt has just conquered Sudan and they're coming towards Babylon. So there was hope maybe will, will, will our exile end and all that. And now God took the opportunity because what happened, the king of Egypt who had conquered at this 
I was called Sametic II. Sametic II, the king of Egypt who had conquered. As the conversation was going on, and Zedekiah showed interest of entering um, a, a, a treaty with him, that king fell ill and he died. And after his demise, Nebuchadnezzar discovered about the conspiracy that Zedekiah wanted to enter with Egypt. And that's when he came guns blazing. And, he, and you know, Zedekiah was killed and, you know, Israel was destroyed. So this, this, this is what they were going to inquire the Lord of. And so as they went there, the Lord responds to them. And this response... Um, is what forms the context of uh, beginning from 20 all the way to verse 38. Beginning from verse 5 all the way to 38, you get the context of God's response. And it is divided into four. This is the only way now you can understand this particular. It's divided into four. The first level, the Lord first of all takes them through a historical journey. Remember we said he's trying to show them their, their, their uniform moral plane, how they have disobeyed God. And God is also trying to show his uniform uh, faithful grace and also show them their repeated rebelliousness and also show them how he has always risen to guard his name and his reputation. So beginning from verse 5 to 9, beginning from verse 5 to 9, the Lord gives four successive periods in Egypt. I mean, in, in, in their lives. Number one, he divides this into four. He gives their, their, their period in Egypt, and that is between verse 5 to 9. He gives a period in the wilderness, that is between verse 10 to 26. And then there is the promised land between 27 to 29, and then the present time between 30 to 38. So we see the whole of between verse 5 all the way to 38, the Lord tries to show them consistently how they were unfaithful in Egypt, how they were unfaithful in the wilderness, how they were unfaithful in the promised land, and even how they were and are still unfaithful even now. So he's giving them their historical record and sequence of how they have always been rebellious against his statues. And so he begins by pointing out their dwelling as they were in Egypt. And very paramount things are mentioned here. Because um, we begin to discover between verse 5 to 9, um, we begin to discover that when the children of Israel were living in Egypt, they began to serve the idols of Egypt. And it looks like God sent some messengers to warn them against that when they were captives in Egypt, they submitted to the gods of Egypt. And it looks like there are a few messengers that were sent there so that um, uh, um, uh, uh, to go and warn them. Because the Lord reminded these elders that he had chosen the Israelites. He also made himself known to them. Uh, he also availed his promises to them. And he had also promised to get the children of Egypt out of captivity. But the Lord told Israel to abandon the de detestable, defiling idols of Egypt. We realize while they were in Egypt, is like they served these idols. Remember, the contention between Israel and God is Israel submitting to God in sovereignty and submitting to one true God who is Yahweh and who is their God. This time he talks to Israel as a nation, not just as the seed of Abraham. And he points their error while in Egypt. They served other gods, though they were aware of who they are supposed to serve. That's why it was even strange. Even Moses didn't know who God was. He took uh, God to introduce himself and tell him, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He took the priest in the wilderness to introduce Moses to the, to the reality of the true God that he was serving. So we begin to see this is very technical. So the Lord, first of all, has to point. Say to them, that says the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel, divine selection, and raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob, and made myself made known in them in the land. So God revealed himself to Israel while they were in Egypt as captives. 
What did I do? I raised my hand in an oath to them saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all the land. Then I said to them, each of you throw away the abominations which are before his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. When they got in the wilderness, they never abandoned these gods. You even remember the scene of Achan when they got in the promised land in the book of Joshua where this man buried an idol in the camp. So the point here is that in Egypt, they gave themselves over to the idols. When they were delivered from Egypt, some of them still carried the idols of Egypt. In the wilderness, and we're going to look that, they raised the golden calf. That was an ancient Egyptian god. So the Lord is trying to set a moral plane consistently these people have not been you know abiding or submitting by me and then he says but they rebelled against me and will not obey me they did not all cast away the abomination which were before their eyes nor did they forsake the idols of egypt then i said i will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land but i acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the gentiles among whom they were in those sight i had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of egypt you know just reading that portion of ezekiel it opens a very uh, mysterious dimension that god had revealed himself to the egyptians i mean to the children of israel in egypt he had revealed himself they were well evangelized. They knew the true living God. And God in Egypt made an oath. He promised them that he was going to deliver them from the bondage of Pharaoh and, the, and, and you know, the, the, the oppressiveness that was upon them through Pharaoh. But above all, he wanted them to abandon the idols and the gods of Egypt. And it looked like you'll find this statement repeatedly. You know, my fury rose and I wanted to judge them. But for the sake of my reputation, the, when we look at what we call the name of God, the name of God. Now, um, the many names that are attached to Yahweh, these are revelations that people got about God. Yahweh means the self-existence one. Uh, and so when we say Yahweh Yireh, this is a name that was given to him after men encountered that dimension in God. So when we look at the name of God, the name of God carries the character and the character of God is an unchanging character. So God has to be the faithful one. He must be the one that fulfills what he says. So Israel messes up and God cannot go against his identity. And that's where the reputation comes. He's not a man to lie, neither the son of man to repent. So when God speaks, he's tied by what he says because um, he, must, he must fulfill what he has uttered. You know, he has exalted his word above his titles. So ideally in this context, he begins to show us that there are many times he wanted to flow in judgment, but his judgment was withheld because of his reputation. And we see this consistent character of God, you know, matches through scripture. Because even on Calvary, God was, quote unquote, caught up in his character. He's a loving God. So in his love, he doesn't want to judge man. But he's a judge. He must judge sin. So there is a conflict. And that's why now Jesus comes to break the, the bond of conflict. Because he pours his wrath on Jesus so that... His love is expressed to man, but his justice is released upon Jesus. It's called the antinomy nature of the Father. So ideally at this level, we begin to see this very powerfully. And this will form the basis of the conversation. Four areas, Egypt, wilderness, promised land, and also their current situation. That's the summary. So beginning from verse 10 all the way to 26, we now begin to see the unfaithfulness of Israel, the faithfulness of God, the consistent rebelliousness, and God guarding his character again, but this time it's in the wilderness. And the Bible says, therefore I made them go out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. Now we are beginning with the wilderness. And I gave them my statues and showed them my judgment, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be assigned between them. So he gave them his Sabbath, his statues and judgments. What are the statues? These are the law. Why was the law given? So that the law could uh, govern the relationship between a holy God and a sinful man. 
and in observant of the statues, of course, the statues came with judgments because the point is, if you do this, I'll do this. So the other side is, if you don't do, then something else will happen. That's the judgment, the repercussion. So where statues or law survive, then repercussions automatic. Then he also gave them the mandate to observe the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was very important um, because, uh, uh, because number one, the Sabbath was a time they were supposed to think about the Lord um, and, and, you know, just meditate on his goodness. Um, uh, uh, the Sabbath had two, uh, two importance. It, it demonstrated the uniqueness of Israel among other nations. It also demonstrated their sanctification unto Yahweh. And it also reminded them of Yahweh creation of the, of the cosmos or the world. The dominance. Um, and, and it was also a central sign of the Old Testament. So observing the Sabbath was very key. It was very key. It, it identified them as a people set apart for God. That is the way observing the Sabbath was. Not only did that do it, but it, it was also as it was it reminded them of God as the creator of the universe. It was also uh, uh, the day Israel needed to express their uniqueness among other nations. And this Sabbath, of course, it was a day of worship and a day of fellowship. So he encouraged them. And you can see the plurality here. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths, Sabbaths, Sabbath, not one, but plurality because if, if you had the Passover on Friday, Thursday was always a Sabbath. I mean, no, if the Passover fell on Thursday and, 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 and Thursday is a working day, then that Thursday became a Sabbath. It's the same way. When a holiday, fall, when a holiday falls on a weekday, uh, it's always a day where we rest. It's, that, that was the culture. So if one of the festivals of the Israelites fell on a weekday, that weekday was a Sabbath. And that's why now you realize there are many Sabbaths in Scripture. It's not just one. Sabbath means the day of rest. And most of the times the Israelites rested because of spiritual activities. And then he said, um, he continues, Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbath. Meaning that they never observed, the, that this is in the wilderness now. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles. Again, the same word is repeated. Um, so that his name can be guarded. And that name profane, that name profane means when men harbor thoughts of him um, inconsistently with his character. Profane is when men have a different idea of God that is not consistent with his character. So again, the Lord is guarding his reputation. To profane is to have a different thought of God that, is, that does not match his character. So we begin to see again, God is guarding his reputation. Israel has fallen. They're not obeying the statutes of the Lord. They're not keeping the Sabbath. They're not obeying his commandments. Um, and and, and, and God, God wants to move in wrath. But again, he has to guard his name. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I will not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all land, because they despite my judgment and did not walk in my statutes, but profane my Sabbath, for their hearts went after their idols. Nevertheless, my eyes spared them from destruction. I did not make an end of them in the wilderness. But I say to their children in the wilderness, do not walk in the statues of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourself with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statues, keep my judgment and do them. Hallow my Sabbath and there will be a sign between me and you that um, know that I am the Lord. So we begin to see all the way from uh, verse 10 to 26. So we see that after this generation disobeyed the Lord, this is a generation that died in Banea Gadesh. Remember, it is only two people that made it to the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. Two million people left Egypt, but because of their mummery, they sent 12 spies. We know that story. They sent 12 spies. They went to the promised land and they came back. Ten of them came back with a bad report. And they say the men, they are like giants. And this stirred 
are a disbeliever among the people and they never believed the Lord and the Lord was angry and he said they will not enter and they began to go round in circles in Banea Gadesh until the disbelieving generation died and another generation was born and that's what the Lord is talking about he's telling that generation that generation never tasted Egypt that generation was born in the wilderness and he's telling them that is the generation that was given the book of Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy simply means the repetition of the law. So that generation now was given. And these, here we can see a Deuteronomy. But I say to their children in the wilderness, do not walk in the statues of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statues, keep my judgments, and do them. Hallow my Sabbath, and there will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. It's a sign of a covenant. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to observe my judgment, which if a man does, he shall leave them, but they profane my Sabbath. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I will drew my hand and acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned in the sight of the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. Also, I raised my hand in an oath to those in the wilderness that I will scatter them among the Gentiles and disperse them throughout the countries because they had not executed my judgments, but had, despite my statutes, profaned my Sabbath, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. Therefore, I also gave them up to statutes that were not good and judgments by which they could not live, and I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts in that they caused all their firstborn to pass through the fire, that I might make them desolate and that they might know that I am the Lord. Now, that is the first level. Uh, so we see there is God painting a picture to them in Egypt. Worshipping of idols, not following the Lord, but God with, withdrawing his wrath so that his name, the, his name is not profaned. So he must guard his reputation. Profane simply means that those in the world will have a different attitude and revelation about God other than the reality of who he is. Then we come to the wilderness. A generation leaves Egypt and they still don't walk in his statues and judgments. They don't keep the Sabbath. The Lord is angry at them. He vows they will not enter the promised land. That generation dies. But their children also who rise, they also don't keep his statues. But the Lord still has to refrain himself from judging them so that the Gentiles don't have a wrong revelation of who he is. You know, just looking at it in the natural, um, there are times I remember my mom. There are times we'll go to uh, a visitor's home and we'll have all the freedom. We'll play around and all that. And my mom will just look at us. She cannot act in violence um, so that, uh, quote unquote, as chome, and many a times when we got home, either we'll get a beating or she will tell us next time. When we get in a person's house, I don't want you to see do one, two, three. A serious warning will come. But in that environment, she will not punish us. Because um, she wants to present herself as this very approachable mother and this very good mother and this very good woman. Not very violent. And this is the same thing God does not want to God does not want the Gentiles to have a wrong impression about who he is. And so he has to, to re retrieve his judgment. Not because Israel is living right, but because he has to guard his name. He must guard his name. And so beginning from verse 25, uh, beginning from verse 25, uh, 27 to 29, 27 to 29, it is the children of Israel rebelling. Uh, this is now Israel uh, um, this is Israel rebelling in the promised land and these are just two verses therefore son of man speak to the house of Israel and say to them thus is the Lord God in these two your fathers have blasphemed me by being unfaithful to me when I brought them into the land concerning which I had raised my hand in an oath to give them and they saw all the high hills and all the thick trees there they offered their sacrifices and provoked me with their offerings there they also sent up their sweet aroma and poured out other drink offering. Then I said to them, what is this high place to which you go? So its name is called Bama. 
Bama to this day. Therefore say uh, to the house of Israel, that says the Lord, you are defiling yourself in the manner of your fathers. Now, 27 to 29 is the children of Israel and their conduct in the promised land. Remember, we are looking at four areas, Egypt, wilderness, promised land, and their current status. This is the summary of chapter number 20. And we're also looking at four things. Um, God laying a consistent pattern uh, of, of Israel and faithfulness. God also laying his consistent pattern uh, in terms of his faithfulness. So God begins by laying a pattern of uniform moral plane upon Israel. He also lays a pattern of his faithfulness. He also shows a pattern of persistence, rebelliousness, and he also lays a pattern of his continuous reputation. Four things that are happening in every every generation. Um, so even in the promised land, the children of Israel still continued to serve other gods, the Canaanites God, and this is where they were supposed to be settled. They worshipped idols in Egypt, in the wilderness, and even in the place of the promise. Um, and they, they identified the high places, they identified the places, uh, the bushes, and they gave libations, pouring, and they offered sacrifices to strange gods. We even saw in the wilderness, some of them gave out their children uh, to the fire. There were rituals that used to happen in those days to the gods of Molech, where children would pass through the fire as a ritual of trying to appease the gods, and most of the times these were firstborns. So we begin to see that Israel got enticed into idolatry. And you know, personally, when I look at the journey of Israel and God in the whole of the Old Testament, it was a journey of them falling into idolatry, strange gods, territorial spirits manifesting as deities seeking worship, and it was also God demanding to be worshipped as the true living God. And I want to believe that contention has not ended even in our day. I want to believe the contention even today is for men bowing down to mammon, to, 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 to you know, the principalities that find expression in our day. So, and it is the place of total surrender to Yahweh as the true living God. And then from verse 30 to 38, now God is speaking to Israel in their day. He's building a historical case and he's telling these people, what your fathers did, you're not different from them. You're not different from them. But this time, I'll, I'll now pass my judgment. This time, I am moving with judgment because I must judge you. Um, uh, I, I must judge you. So beginning from verse 30, now the Lord is speaking to Israel. And he's saying to them, Therefore say to the house of Israel, that says the Lord God, Are you defiling yourselves in the manner of your fathers and committing harlotry according to their abomination? Now this is the current Israel. Remember it, it was the elders who went to inquire of the Lord. Remember the background. They are thinking Egypt will be their savior. But this time God must show them the judgment will not be stopped. It's inevitable. And he says, I will not be inquired of by you. What you have in your mind shall never be. When you say we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries, serving wood and stone, God is telling them, after this chastisement, there will be a returning back. And then, um, in the same breath, there is prophecy coming. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. Some people consider this as a futuristic prophecy of restoration of Israel. But looking at the context, we'll begin to see that Babylon was not their permanent destination. The Lord rose through Cyrus and the children of Israel went back to the place of promise. I will rule over you. I will bring you out from the people. The people here, of course, is where they are. Gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out. At this time, the whole nation of Israel was scattered. There are those who were in Babylon, the others were in Assyria. When the kingdom was divided into two, the northern and the southern, when the attack came, the Assyrian attacked uh, a part of the ten tribes, 
and also the, the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, uh, which formed the, the community of Judah, were now taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. So Israel was a desolate land and the Israelites were scattered. And there is a prophecy. Uh, with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there I will plead my case with you face to face, just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So I will plead my case with you, says the Lord. Um, this is now future hope of restoration, and the Lord will explain to them why the judgment came. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Now, the language of passing under the rod was the language of a shepherd. The, 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 when, the shepherd uh, when the shepherd was taking out his flock, he would allow every sheep to pass under the rod as he counts them. That was the language. This language was also very key while giving tithe. Because while you are tithing a tithe of an animal, you are supposed to put your rod and count. So number one, two, three, four. And every tenth animal was given as a tithe. Whether it was the best or the weakest, where the rod fell, that's where the tithe fell. So this is God introducing himself as a shepherd. And he's introducing himself with responsibility over Israel. Thy staff and thy rod, thy staff and thy rod, they comfort me. The rod was also... The weapon the shepherd showed to the to the to the to the prey. You never showed the sheep. Anytime the sheep saw a shepherd with a rod, it communicated protection. So, but it is also a language of chastisement. And so he says, of course, mm, I'll make you pass under my rod, and I will bring you unto the bond of the covenant. As I number you among my people, you'll enter into the covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you. And those who transgressed against me, I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. There will be a separation between those who worship Yahweh, those who have served him, and those who have rebelled against him, even in those areas where they were taken as exiles. The concept of exile was to return Israel to the Lord. But there are still some people who never Returned, their hearts were still hardened and they didn't return to the Lord. And then um, uh, uh, when you now go uh, beyond verse, when you begin now to go to verse 38, verse 30, from verse 39 all the way to 44, uh, because between there you begin to see what we call an implication of this history lesson. Uh, now, this is what the Lord, this is, after all this history, what they have done, and now the Lord gives them an, uh, an implication. As for you, O house of Israel, that says the Lord God, go serve every one of you his idols. And thereafter, if you will not obey me, but profane my holy name no more with your gifts and your idols. For on my holy mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there, all the house of Israel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I will accept them, and there I will require your offering and first fruit of your sacrifices together with all your holy things. I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will be hallowed in you before the Gentiles. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I raised my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. So after this exile, after this scattering, after the chastisement, there will be a returning from their hearts. And there you shall remember your ways and all your doings with which you are defiled. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight because of all the evil that you have committed. You yourself will look at what you've done and you'll look at it and say, indeed, this was evil. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I've dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doing. O house of Israel, says the Lord. So this is a promise of restoration, but after judgment. This does not suspend judgment. This is the Lord saying, I will restore you. 
you will lift me in the mountains. You guys will look back and realize, by the way, we did evil before the eyes of the Lord. What we did was not right. You know, even just taking a very uh, natural, carnal example, even in our own homes, there are times after punishment, after just maturing a little bit, you realize, by the way, I was wrong. And what I did was not right. Even sometimes we'll do something bad and expect punishment. We know that we know we are wrong. It's only that God gave Israel time to repent. But they never repented. But they kept on justifying. So this, as I said, the, the, the judgment hammer had already fallen. But the Lord is now telling them, after you are scattered all over, I'll gather you again. And you will know I'm your God and you'll lift me again. And then... 45 to 49 is now the pronunciation. It's a parable, but in this parable is the pronunciation of the dynamic of judgment that is coming. And he says, furthermore, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face towards the south. Preach against the south and prophesy against the forest land, the south and say to the forest of the south. Hear the word of the Lord that says the Lord God. Behold, I will kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. Those are two trees. The green tree represents the productive tree. The dry tree represents the unproductive trees. The fire there represents judgment. This is a parable. The fire there represents judgment. And the Bible says, every green tree and every dry tree in you, the blazing flame shall not be quenched and all faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that the Lord hath kindled it and it shall not be quenched. Now, what is God saying? As Nebuchadnezzar comes to wage war against Israel, both the Russians and the Unrushians are going to suffer the consequences. The green tree and the dry tree, both of them will suffer the consequences. Of course, they will, as they all suffer the consequences, they will all know that I, the Lord, am responsible for this judgment. Even the Russians, this judgment may not necessarily spare the Russians, but they will also suffer the consequences of my judgment. And even the Russians will know that I have judged Israel. I'll give you a good example. Of course, we know in the previous chapter 18, the Lord had promised there will be a separation and a setting apart of anyone um, that, that never defiled the Lord. But there, there is a level of judgment that affects everyone. If today we enter into error and the Lord decided to judge us with famine, it means even the Russians will suffer famine. Though the Russians may have understanding that this is God's judgment, they will turn back into prayer, but it means they will also suffer famine. So this judgment that was coming upon Israel, the exile, even the innocent Russia's people ended up in the exile. They suffered the consequences of the wrath of Nebuchadnezzar. And that's what the parable simply says. The fact that I will separate them that obey me, it does not mean the effects of the fire will not be felt among the two. Then I said, our Lord God, they say of me, does he not speak parables? Of course, now, this from 45 to 49 is a parable. And we have decoded it. The fire represents judgment. The green tree represents the righteous. And the dry tree represents the wicked. And all of them will suffer the judgment that will come from uh, Babylon. Let us summarize chapter number 20. From 20 to 23, the Lord is speaking motivation of the judgment. From... 10 uh, from, from I, I think, 12 to 19, uh, the verdict is already made. So, uh, he opens up and shares four very important things. He shows the consistency of their wickedness, shows the consistency of his faithfulness, he shows the consistency of their rebelliousness, and he also shows the consistency of him guarding his reputation. Very important. The second thing, uh, beginning from verse 5 all the way to 38, it's divided into four portions how Israel has been behaving in Egypt, in the wilderness, in the promised land, and also in the current status. And then after that, there is a small portion of prophecy of hope, of restoration. Um, and then we come to the parable of the nature of the judgment and how it's going to take place. 
So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, let us meet tomorrow, even as we look at chapter number 21. And we pray for grace that will continue. And I'm sorry that I, I was a little bit gone, but now we are back. Let's pray. Our Father and our Lord, we bless you. And we thank you. Thank you for opening the scripture. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for teaching us. And thank you, O oh God, for opening our eyes. And we are learning. And we repent for any idolatry and anything that we have engaged ourselves and involved ourselves into. And tonight, O oh Father, I pray for everyone. May our hearts be totally sold out to you. We give you honor. We give you glory. And it is in Jesus' name that we have prayed and believed. May God bless you. May God lead you. May God watch over you. And you know, see in the midnight prayer, but we can give our offering and the giving details already there. 817 and 0726 714 God bless you.